Hi, I'm Maud. My pronouns are they, them, and welcome back to Tunes Tuesday, a weekly series where I sit down with 2S LGBTQ plus bands and musicians to talk to them about their music, their experiences, and so much more. Joining me this week is Portland-based rock soul rap artist, Nexus J. It is so wonderful to have you here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Nexus J, pronouns are she, her. I did just recently relocate um, to Portland. I'm originally from Chicago, so I just wanted to throw that out there because that's certainly where a lot of my heart is. Um, but yes, I do a lot of um, fusion music with the genres that Maud mentioned, and I also do a lot of poetry. Um, and hopefully down the road in my music career, pretty much every, every genre there is. That's something I think about. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And I also love how, you know, how often artists now are really experimenting with genre. So I love that you're bringing that up and that you're really looking forward to a future with more of that. Totally. I think I was having conversations recently with folks where I would just mention like, yeah, I, it's always been in my head that I want to do a country song so badly. I mean, there's so many reasons that the, that's the case, but it's one of the most whitewashed genres that exist and have existed today. And it's probably because I've watched The Voice for several seasons and Blake Shelton just, well, maybe I shouldn't ostracize future <laughs> managers, but Blake Shelton kind of gets under my skin and I'm like, ugh, I just want to get up there and just really rip it at a country song but that could be a tangent <laughs> i i genuinely really hope you do that one day i am personally always looking for more queer country <laughs> um because i feel like that like there's so many queer country roots as well that i think get forgotten okay. about so quickly um because you know it's all like straight cis white men kind of you know yep. prominently being shown in the genre so this is all tangential but i absolutely love talking about it <laughs> Uh, but to speak a little more to, towards the music that you're currently creating uh, outside of, you know, these future ideas is that you've recently released Come Over and Ruin Me. So these are two of your 2021 singles that make up what you call your bad girl trilogy. And yeah. as far as lyrics go, they have fantastic lyrics. And, you know, what does it mean to you as a queer woman to explicitly explore sexuality through those lyrics and through the sound of the song? Mm, totally. Um, love this question. Um, I mean, I also prefer to add the lens of like my intersectional identities because I cannot separate me being a, a Black queer person. And with that in mind, um, it means so much. It's in, it's all based in like love for myself and my community and freedom and um, truth and authenticity because, you know, uh, the queer community and Black femmes historically have been hypersexualized and thus, you know, dehumanized and um, the experience of sex and pleasure becoming or at least attempting, people attempting to separate us from those qualities and to control those qualities about us. And so I really, when I was writing Come Over specifically, I really wanted to touch on this nuance of like, what, like just primally desiring someone, but it not coming from the point of view of the male gaze. That was really what I was trying to get at um, because sex is fun. And, you know, sometimes sex doesn't have to be this like, incredibly in-depth soul intertwined thing though I am a hopeless romantic so I'm not saying that I don't want that but um I just wanted to touch on like really fun queer sexuality that also felt safe and didn't feel like this underlying sense of danger and a whole host of other challenging things that tends to happen with sex driven songs these days so it means so 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 much um and um, definitely within this past year or two, I was coming into my own sexuality and that's why these songs came out because there was a very authentic parallel of more confidence in exploring those things. Um, and I think that's where Rue and Me came in when I was like, yeah, this is me. <laughs> and, and I love this about me. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanna be really bold and confident about that. So yeah, I mean, it means a lot for sure. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I really appreciate you speaking to that intersectionality. I know when I first listened to the songs, it kind of overwhelmed me how much I could feel the fact that, you know, it wasn't being fetishized, that, you know, it wasn't being turned into something. It wasn't. It was just being felt and expressed. And I thought that was amazing. I could explode. <laughs> that that just means so much um yeah I will say I'm I'm not sure if, if I've had that particular language for feedback quite yet like someone's explicitly saying like I could feel that you weren't fetishizing that really hits home so I just so appreciate that that's what you got from it yeah absolutely I'm so happy that I had this opportunity to share that with you I, I do think it's something that definitely needs to be talked about. Um, and have you, I mean, as far as that feedback, though, have you sensed that other people have been drawn to your music because of the fact that, you know, it's not from that male gaze standpoint, but it is exploring these themes? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, and I think that there's some nuance and probably more unpacking that I would have to do to really know for sure. Um, because I would say, if I'm looking at the music that I've put out, I've also recognized that this material has gained a lot more attention. And I've reflected on that and I would think, I mean, I haven't done the math of the metrics quite yet, but I mean, I think it's because it's very um, sex driven. And then I kind of dig into that to, um, I just have been, what's the word I'm looking for, processing that. Because I think it comes down to this question of, is that really something I feel good about, I guess? And I'm not really sure. Because I would hope, you know, that when folks are taking it in, they feel as I do, and they feel as you've named that you do, and they're separating it from that, um, that male gaze and that, uh, fetish tendency but I think sometimes it's hard to tell for sure um so I I don't even know if I'm getting away from the question at hand here but um I think that's like my initial reaction is I still feel very gray area about the amount of response that I've gotten compared to other like more vulnerable very sad like a lot more personal stories as opposed to me saying like yeah I feel hot and I really want to have sex with this person so I appreciate it and I still love my work. It's really important. At the same time, I think, like I said, I could, I'm just repeating myself at this point. I think it's still a processing point for me, the, the um, response that I've had to this project. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I love hearing about like the thoughtfulness that you not only put into the music before releasing it, but also, you know, after releasing it, seeing how you continue to feel about it and, you know, looking at how other people are feeling about it and perceiving it as well and really seeing that bigger picture of it. I appreciate that too. It helps with the, with the anxiety. <laughs> Definitely. And also speaking about these singles, so two of these singles were mixed and produced by Supernova, uh, who is another incredible queer artist that has actually been on this show as well. So how does being able to work and create with other queer people impact your music? Definitely. Um, I could fan about Supernova forever. And I feel like if you know her, you would too, <laughs> because... I just felt so, I'll just gush on her a little bit before I answer your question because I think she deserves it. I mean, I was just incredibly um, honored, like at the end of the day to work with her. Um, and I actually didn't know much about her work before connecting. I connected with her through knowing that she had done work with Glitter Money, who I'm not sure if you know of, but whoever's listening to this also go listen to Glitter Money, incredible rap duo um but anyhow it was like once i got to work with her there was this space of patience and like feeling safe that i've never felt working with any other producer before and um supernova is the first trans woman of color that i've worked with as a producer and i'm st again I process a lot. I'm still unpacking that because I don't want to be unfair, but prior to that, I've only worked with cis men 
And it's never felt as good as it felt when I was working with Supernova. And I think that there is this sensibility to yes, like the community and kinship we shared. And sure, I don't want to like, I don't want to sidestep that Supernova is also just an incredible person. So I think it's both of those things together. But what I took from my time with Supernova um, that helped me make my art the best it can be is the amount, yeah, like I said, the patience for the, the sheer amount of questions I would ask, the type, the amount of times I would do one take for this little tiny vocal thing. And she would just never make me feel rushed or wrong for doing things I felt I needed to do to make the song what I wanted it to be. And I, yeah, that was definitely new for me, for sure. Um, so that's something I really appreciated. And I will say, you know, with me, especially come over the, the POV that, that that song was in, um, I just so appreciated, well, because this is a little background, I recorded some of that song with her. She was not the producer for Come Over, but I did record a little bit of it with her in her studio. Um, and it was just so great to connect um, and create in that space with another queer artist. And furthermore, her responses to the music as time went on, you know, hit at a really deep soul level because we did share that queer community, um, you know, where I'm sure I would appreciate if a cis man told me they liked the song, but <laughs> I think there's just a different level of like love and feeling seen and heard um, that after I was done with one session, I'm like, great, I'm so ready to like come back and be very excited to share more of this experience with that particular artist because she gets where I'm coming from. So yeah, it's, it was beautiful. It was magical. And I can't wait to create with her again. Yeah, absolutely. I love hearing that. That makes me so happy for so many reasons. Uh, but I just absolutely love the fact that, you know, we can find people within our communities to have that dynamic with and that we can like truly trust and feel safe to like share our artistic practice with them. Um, because I absolutely, you know, think you touched on it where it's, you know, not only are we being fully seen as artists, but our work is being fully seen for, for how we want it to be seen. Totally. And it, it made me think to add on also, separate from me being an artist, sometimes I may, like, I just think it's helpful to compartmentalize or maybe just, yeah, in terms of me processing my own artistic journey, I'm also a person that's like learning and engaging with art. And I think across my my artistic career, there's been a lot of insecurity and a lot of imposter syndrome that prevented me from taking steps forward and putting in effort and investing in myself. And again, just to loop back to how absolutely vital and um, crucial this feeling of safety is, um, I think it just speaks to that because again, um, there were so many like insecurities that I was walking into that room with, but when you meet a person that just says, that's fine, like no worries. And yeah, sure, I'll answer that question. And it just outpouring of love, patience and space, it just made the like inner child nexus really feel so good. And again, aside from artistry, just as a person, I so appreciate those like moments of connection. I think they're so, so needed and valuable. Yeah, absolutely. That is, that is so beautiful. Um, and, you know, moving on, even though I, I feel like I could talk about this forever, because it just feels like a love letter to the queer community. Uh, <laughs> but moving on, because I know earlier you mentioned that, you know, before releasing the Bad Girl trilogy, you were releasing a lot more vulnerable pieces, pieces that, you know, really explored other areas and even exploring those in different styles. So I know back in 2019, you released your first visual project with Exhibit O. And through its visuals and words, Exhibit O discusses, you know, mental health, psychiatric experiences, queerness and finding oneself, as well as, you know, self-harm in an immensely vulnerable way. As this was your first visual project, you know, what drove you to create it and how did it feel to see the final product? 
Totally. Um, yeah, I'll answer the first part of that question of what drove me to this project. Um, it definitely has a lot of layers to it in that the poem itself was um, a school assignment when I was in college um, studying um, creative composition. So it came from that. And I'm a person who navigates depression and anxiety still to this day. Um, and I have personally experienced um, suicidal ideation and self-harm. And so it just was my attempt to um, just express truly what that felt like without feeling the need to apologize for it or make the person hearing it feel comfortable showing what this was like for me. Um, and to give, I, guess, I suppose, one more layer of context, that in and of itself has been a really important goal, like that attempt to just not apologize for how I feel, even if the feelings are really heavy and uncomfortable, because I'm just speaking for my own healing journey, it's necessary because so oftentimes when I feel that way, my first reaction is to feel so ashamed of even feeling that way. And to then like, I can't remember when I come, came across this, but someone termed it as having like secondary emotions about things and how so often those are not very helpful. <laughs> like being sad and then being mad at yourself for being sad. Like the being mad is like very rarely ever a beneficial thing to kind of lean into. So yeah, um, that's why I made the piece, just to say, this is how I feel. So I'm going to accept that this is how I feel. Um, and then it came to be a visual um, when I was partnering a lot more often with a, a videographer slash photography friend of mine. Um, and it just felt like one of the poems that I've been most proud of and could so easily see the visuals in my brain. Like I just saw all of these scenes with my hands dragging through the sand and um, the imagery of the water and being in um, showers and things like that. So I think, yeah, it just kind of came together pretty organically. Um, it was such a long shoot. Wow, it's, I haven't thought about this project in a minute. It's been a couple of years, but just going back memory lane, it was such a long shoot. I was so tired. <laughs> There's black paint everywhere. I don't know like whomever has seen this, if you're listening to this now, it was a mess and such a mess to clean up. Um, <laughs> um, and it was very interesting because in thinking about <laughs> creating it, I hadn't quite realize that I would be acting. Like, of course I knew that logically, but then you get in front of the camera and you're like, oh, I have to think about how I feel when I truly feel this depressed. And like, and then I have to have someone capturing it. Like it's such an incredibly vulnerable thing to do. So I would also say it was this incredible moment of dipping into the art form of acting. Um, and it was really, really scary. I'll say it was just really scary. Um, but very, very cool to practice that and to also, I think, flex the muscle of not letting that discomfort run the show um, and just really surrendering myself to the whole goal, which was like, this is how I feel when I feel this depressed and anxious and I'm going to show it. Um, so yeah, it was very messy, very vulnerable. Um, and then I think you had asked, like, how did it feel when it came out, if, if I'm correct? It felt, hmm, how did it feel? Um, I would say that it felt, yeah, really, really a mix of emotions. Um, again, just super, super vulnerable, um, but also incredibly empowering. I think that that was a big feeling I had because I really, when I do work like this, I'm so sure that people have felt so similarly to me. And I think when I released this piece, some of me could like zoom out and look objectively and say like, I am in a position of creating something where when someone else sees it, and if they felt similarly, they don't feel so alone and they don't feel so 
ashamed or so afraid of themselves or yeah, a lot of a host of these other types of secondary emotions that I named before. Um, and I think I felt really empowered for that reason that I could be brave enough to share this um, made me feel really great. So yeah, great question. I hope that wasn't too much of like pudding <laughs> the way I answered it, but it kind of feels like pudding <laughs> just, just the way I feel towards the project. No, that was all incredibly powerful. I mean, it is such a powerful piece to watch. So, you know, hearing the emotions and really what went on behind the scenes. And I feel like even that, you know, idea of the paint being so messy and so hard to clean up, you know, I feel like that even just ties in with the feelings of the piece, though, that, you know, these these can be like messy times and messy emotions. So it seems like so much of the process behind it was so connected. Yes, it's true. When I said that, I was like, yes, there's a parallel there. <laughs> so I'm very glad that you caught on to that. Um, and you know, it, it's really interesting because as I've moved here to Portland, um, my depression and anxiety have been at the top of their game. And yes, I'm totally using humor to cope and that's fine. Um, but yeah, it's it's been incredibly rough um, so it's just interesting to be in this interview right now, like talking about a piece that I wrote so long ago. And it's actually very interesting because when I wrote that piece, um, my relationship with self-harm had felt so distant from me from that time. Like I really place my experiences with self-harm as something that belongs to like the high school version of myself. Um, yet as I've gone on a journey of mental health over the years, I've learned um, to remember that all of the stages of who I've been is still a part of me. Um, Cause I've found me myself in my mind at really, really low points to where I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't felt this way since, you know, whenever. Um, and I've learned to practice not being caught so off guard by going to mental spaces that I might have been in the past. Because again, that's the fastest track, for me at least, to go down shame lane. Um, and like, oh, I've backslid. And like, what is all this, these years of therapy even done? And like, you could just go on forever. <laughs> but um, I think it's also good to remember that it's OK to experience things that you've experienced in the past. Um, and that's just being human. And it doesn't, it's not specifically a marker of your progress or lack thereof. So that's just something I thought of in even having this conversation about this piece because transparently times have been rough. <laughs> so it's interesting. Yeah. And I mean, I really appreciate your honesty with sharing that. You know, I know more and more people are starting to talk about their mental health journeys publicly and such, but there is still a lot of stigma, especially, you know, as you mentioned before, when we look at intersectional identities about, you know, who is allowed to talk about their struggles with mental health versus who isn't. Um, so that, you know, is incredibly powerful to share. Uh, and do you see yourself, you know, using this experience of visual mediums and mixing it in, mixing it in with your future music? I do, I do. Um, I definitely want to put out a music video for songs that are coming up. Um, I think it'll just have to be a secret until then because there are just little noodles of pieces that <laughs> need to be put together. But yes, that is definitely a dream of mine. Cannot wait um, to be able to do that. And I'll be excited at which song slash songs that could be applying to. <laughs> That's so exciting. I definitely look forward to that as well. I hope everyone watching this is looking forward to that. And if you are, I highly recommend checking out all the links below this video, which share the songs that we talked about today. There will be a link to that Exhibit O video. And you can also stay in touch through social media to make sure that you don't miss all the future projects that we have touched on or potentially alluded to the future existence of. Thank you <laughs> so much for joining me this week. This was such a delightful conversation and Nexus J will be playing us out. I'm all 
I'm a, I'm a rope bunny, masochist, exhibitionist, sadistic bratty bitch. Helen, I'm a